This lecture is specific to conceptual physics AB, and we now begin our next unit. Our next unit covers oscillations, waves, and sound. Now, previously, we have discussed oscillations. We've done so, however, in the context of energy transfer. For example, in this particular case, spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy is transforming back and forth with kinetic energy. So to some extent, we've already described oscillations, but we did so in the context of conservation of energy and energy transfer. Now we examine a little bit of the dynamics associated with oscillations. We'll do so here in this lecture. Okay, let me go ahead and tilt my phone back towards the board and let's refresh our memories with respect to what is being described by the spring force. So let me go ahead and retilt my phone. Like so, I'm going to tilt it up a little bit as well. There we go. Okay, so let's recall the following. Okay, recall the spring force. Let's say that we have a mass attached to a spring and it's oscillating about the equilibrium position of the spring on a horizontal frictionless surface. There's always a typical diagram associated with this. It looks like the following. Okay, so here's a wall or attachment, and then we have the spring like so, and then we have the mass M attached to the spring. Okay, right here we'll say is the equilibrium position. That's the unstressed or uncompressed position of the spring. Okay, recall that the spring has associated with it what is called a spring constant K. So the spring constant K, if you remember, is a measurement of the stiffness or the looseness of the spring. And then the oscillation occurs here, as I said, about the equilibrium position. Okay, the spring force is described in the following way. Okay, right here we have a displacement from the equilibrium position, which is referred to as X, and it doesn't matter if we're stretching or compressing the spring from equilibrium. And the spring force always tries to bring the mass back towards the equilibrium position. The magnitude of the spring force is described by what is called Hooke's Law. The magnitude of the spring force is K times X. So recall these details. Okay, the spring force described by Hooke's Law that force is equal to k times x. What we now want to do in this lecture is we want to examine the parameters that describe an oscillation, specifically the period and the frequency. So let me go ahead and define those terms. We've seen those terms before, but let me now define those terms here in the context of simple harmonic motion. We saw these terms back when we were describing uniform circular motion. If you recall that the period of uniform circular motion is the time necessary for one revolution to occur. The frequency is the reciprocal of that value. In this particular case, the period is the time necessary for one oscillation to occur, and the frequency is the reciprocal of that value, which describes the number of oscillations per second. So let me go ahead and write down these definitions for us here on the board. Okay, so first of all, we have capital T. This is referred to as the period. The period is the time necessary for one oscillation to occur. And the frequency, which is equal to the reciprocal of the period, it's measured in terms of hertz, is the number of oscillations that takes place per second. Number of oscillations per second. Here's how you can understand the relationship between these two quantities. Think of it in the following way. Let's say that the frequency is one hertz. So then therefore one oscillation takes place per second. Therefore, what's the period? The time necessary for one oscillation to occur. It's just one second. Let's say that the frequency is two hertz. So two oscillations takes place per second. Therefore, what's the time necessary for one oscillation to occur? It's a half a second. In other words, once again, frequency and period are inverses of each other. Okay, now what physical quantities about a mass attached to a spring determines what the period and then therefore what the frequency is equal to? 
The following expression is ultimately derived when you set up F equals MA and apply it to a situation involving a horizontal oscillation, or in my case, a vertical oscillation. Showing the mathematics that is necessary to derive the following expression is well beyond the scope of this course. What we're gonna do here is just merely examine the expression itself. And the expression I'm referring to is as follows. Okay, the period of the oscillation, capital T, is described by the following expression. 2 pi multiplied by the square root of m over k, where once again, m is the mass of the oscillator and k is the spring constant. Ultimately, this expression is derived by applying f equals ma to an oscillation. As I mentioned, deriving this for this course is well beyond the scope of this course, but we can just examine the expression itself. In order to do so, I'm going to show you some demonstrations here involving springs. I'm going to have to retilt my phone once again. Okay, so let me go ahead and tilt the phone. Like so, I'm going to tilt downwards as well. There we go. Okay, now let's take a look at how mass affects an oscillation. So what I'm gonna do here is start off with a relatively small amount of mass. If the mass is small and the mass is in the numerator underneath the radical sign in the equation for the period that I just wrote down, this then means that the period is gonna be a small number. The time necessary for one oscillation to occur is gonna be short. The inverse of this then, therefore, is the frequency. This then means that the frequency is a large number. The number of oscillations that takes place per second is fairly large. So now let me go ahead and attach this relatively small mass to the spring and set it into oscillation. And notice how short the period is equal to. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the mass. So what I'm gonna do is detach this small mass and then reattach this large mass like so. So if I now make the mass large, this then means that the period is gonna be large, therefore the frequency is smaller. So if the period is a large number, the frequency then therefore is small, the number of oscillations that takes place per second is a small number. So compare the period here with this larger mass to the one that I had earlier with the smaller mass, and this is obviously a longer period. In addition to the mass, however, what also determines the parameters of an oscillation is the spring constant. The spring constant is described once again by the letter K. It appears in the denominator underneath the radical sign in the expression for the period. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna manipulate the spring constant. I'm gonna start right here with a really loose spring. So if this is a really loose spring, this then means that the spring constant is a small number. If the spring constant is a small number, then the period is gonna be a large number. The time necessary for one oscillation to occur is gonna be large. So let me now go ahead and attach this like so. I'm gonna use this mass here. I'm gonna go ahead and attach it to my spring like this. And then very carefully, I'm gonna set this into oscillation like so. And notice how long the period is here. The reason why the period is so long is because the spring constant is so small. Okay, now I'm gonna use the same mass, this guy here once again, but now I'm gonna use this really stiff spring. So with this really stiff spring here, we have a large spring constant. If the spring constant is large, this then means that the period is gonna be a small number. The time necessary for one oscillation to occur is gonna be small. So now let me go ahead and attach this like so, and then just set it into oscillation, and you can see how short the period is here when I have a really stiff spring. So the two quantities that describe an oscillation, the two most important quantities, that is, are the mass and the spring constant k. Okay, let me retilt my phone back towards the board. Okay, now notice what this expression does not depend upon. Notice that the period does not depend upon the amplitude. That's extremely important. So notice that the period, and then also therefore the frequency, does not 
depend upon the amplitude. The amplitude of the motion, by the way, is the maximum displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position, and the amplitude is referred to as capital A. Let me go ahead and define this here on the board for us. So the amplitude is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. The reason why this is so important is because this ultimately means that an oscillator can be used as a timing element. In other words, you can use it to keep track of time. When this discovery about oscillations was made in the late 17th century, it led immediately to the construction of the first accurate mechanical clocks. So because the period does not depend upon the amplitude, this means that an oscillator can be used as a timing element. And this discovery, when it was made in the late 17th century, it led immediately to the construction of the first precise or accurate mechanical clocks. So this led to the construction of the first accurate mechanical clocks. So let me demonstrate this using my demonstration spring once again. By the way, make sure you have all of this information, of course, copied down into your notes. Let me retilt my phone once more. Okay, so bear with me as I move the phone again. All right, there we are. Okay, now let me go ahead and use my large demonstration spring here to illustrate. Okay, for example, let's say that I take this mass here and I set it into a small amplitude oscillation. That is, like so. And then the amplitude being small here means that the total amount of energy that's present is a small number. And then what I can do with a stopwatch, for example, is I can measure the time necessary for one oscillation to occur. Now let me set this into a larger amplitude oscillation, like so. There is more energy present here than there was in the first situation, but if I use a stopwatch, for example, to measure the time necessary for one oscillation to occur, it would be exactly the same as it is in this case, for example, like so, when the amplitude is small. Therefore, we can use an oscillator as a timing element. Therefore, we can turn it into a clock. The level of precision of your clock is directly dependent upon the period of the oscillation. So, for example, let's just say for the sake of argument, that the period of the oscillation here is one second. Therefore, I can use this oscillator as a clock in order to keep track of time to an accuracy of within one second. This is still the case even as the amplitude here decreases with respect to time because energy is being lost as heat. The period, however, remains the same. Periodically, of course, I have to reach in and wind my clock, for example, by doing something like this. But when I do, I do not change the period in any way. Therefore, we could use this as a clock. So this mechanical clock right here could keep track of time to an accuracy, we'll say, of within one second. Let's say that you plug an electronic clock into an electrical socket. Well, the alternating current is an oscillator. The alternating current in an ordinary electrical socket has a frequency of 60 hertz. It oscillates 60 times per second. Therefore, the period, the time necessary for one oscillation to occur, is 1 60th of a second. Therefore, you can use an electronic clock to keep track of time to an accuracy of within 1 60th of a second, and that's exactly what we do, for example, with the spark timers that we use periodically in laboratory exercises. Recall that the period on the spark timer is 1 60th of a second. The reason for that is because the period of the oscillation of alternating current is 1 60th of a second. The most accurate clocks of all are what are called atomic clocks. What is the oscillator in an atomic clock? It's actually not the atoms. What's actually oscillating in an atomic clock are electrons. They're transitioning between different energy levels within the atoms. The period of the oscillation is in terms of billions of a second. So then therefore, the atomic clocks are the most precise of all because they have such short periods.
We actually no longer base the second on the rotation of the Earth. Atomic clocks are actually more accurate as a clock than the rotation of the Earth because the Earth actually kind of wobbles a little bit as it rotates. So then therefore, for that reason, we now actually base the second upon atomic clocks. Specifically, the clock that is used as the official clock by the United States is at a place in Colorado Springs, Colorado, called the National Bureau of Standards. The, the second is defined in terms of a specific electron transition within a specific isotope of a specific atom. Ultimately then around the world, other countries have their own atomic clocks that they use as official clocks for their countries. And then everybody synchronizes their clocks with respect to each other. So everybody is keeping track of time exactly the same way. So once again, to summarize here, the period of the oscillation does not depend upon the amplitude. It only depends upon the spring constant and the mass that is attached to the spring. In the next part of this lecture, we'll take a look at an example problem.